Fancy Zone released in arcades as a cutesy take on Defender as players were tasked with destroying enemy motherships in a series of infinitely cycling game worlds. The bright visuals are easy on the eyes as the use of strong colours complement the large and detailed sprites. These factors along with a cheerful soundtrack make for a welcoming take on the shooter genre. Don't be fooled however, underneath the cutesy appearance is a game as difficult and intense as any of its era with enemy swarms and bosses that will leave you constantly dodging and weaving. Add another upgrade system on top of that and you had the makings of an 80s arcade classic. Fantasy Zone is fondly remembered and has been ported to a myriad of systems with new ports continuing to see release to this day. Its legacy is certainly Valorn. <laughs> No doubt a raise of eyebrows back in its day, Dino Crisis was the result of Resident Evil director Shinji Mikami wanted to experiment with a new form of survival horror. This new type of horror game would come to be known as Panic Horror. Panic is certainly an apt description. The dinosaurs are faster and more aggressive than zombies, and are willing to break a few rules on the way to their next meal. Doors will be busted open, weapons will be dropped, and wounds will bleed out. If you are thinking of playing it safe and taking it slow, think again. It's a challenging action game, far more so than any of its survival horror siblings, and a good lesson in the pros and cons of heavily oppressive game design. Dino Crisis is decent, but its concept doesn't work as well in execution as Resident Evil's. It's best played if you're survival horror diehard. If you have kept up with it these last 10 years, then you will know that the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game isn't quite what it used to be. While the modern game is enjoyable in its own way, there are those out there who miss the good old days where simplistic combos and set one card pass were considered power plays. Normally you'd have to resort to kidnapping someone to play goat control mirrors for that old school Yu-Gi-Oh! fix, but Konami have a better solution. World Championship 2006 offers everything an old school Yu-Gi-Oh! fan could ask for. Classic metagame, the ability to change band lists, a variety of decks to play against, challenge and puzzle modes, and an authentic selection of nostalgic booster packs. If you're a fan of classic Yu-Gi-Oh then consider this a strong recommendation. If you're new to Yu-Gi-Oh or merely nostalgic then this is still a solid title to pick up and play. An iconic game of its era, Bubble Bobble is the story of twin dragons Bub and Bob as they traverse through the 100 level long cave of monsters to rescue their girlfriends. The focus on single screen levels may have seemed old fashioned in an era where scrolling platforms were all the rage, but what the game lacked in technical achievements it made up for in innovation and execution. The concept was simplistic and easily grasped. Trap enemies and bubbles and pop them for high scores. This alone was enough to make the game enjoyable, but it was the small innovations which made it engaging, as every level presented a unique challenge for the player to overcome. Multiple endings were a novelty which kept players coming back in hopes of seeing the true ending. Bubble Bubble remains a popular game and is often re-released on new systems. This one gets a high recommendation. What more needs to be said about Resident Evil 2? The game released to a rave of critical praise as it bettered the original in almost every way imaginable. It has since gone down in gaming legend for its excellent structure, pacing and world design alongside its myriad of iconic set pieces, enemies and boss battles. With play extending features such as the 4 survival and B scenarios, it is the prime example of what we can call a complete game. No potential has gone to waste here. The game launched the career of Hideki Kamiya and cemented the series as a giant in the gaming landscape. Despite its age, the game still holds up now and is in no way made any worse by the existence of its remake. If you've only played the remake, then you owe it to yourself to play the original. <laughs> The 
The last ever game released in their long-running partnership, Star Fox Adventures was Rare's Nintendo Swan Song as they attempted to bring their N64 brilliance to the GameCube. Originally pitched as a Nintendo 64 game called Dinosaur Planet, it was quickly moved to the GameCube and changed into Star Fox. In hindsight, this change would be to the game's detriment. Star Fox fans would be disappointed with the departure from space combat while Rare themselves were left more restrained by having to work with an established IP. The game ultimately failed to live up to expectations, but still retained the level of quality that had come to be expected from Rare as we got what was overall a very decent Zelda clone. Adventures did an excellent job showcasing the power of the GameCube thanks to its detailed visuals, fur effects and varied environments. Worth playing if you don't mind collectathons and backtracking. Jordan Mechner's Prince of Persia is one of the forefathers of cinematic video games. Its use of rotoscoping to capture and mimic movement turned heads as the game's animations were among the most detailed and realistic in the medium. The level designs were well constructed, with its many puzzles rewarding thoughtful players who could avoid the dangers of the castle dungeon. It would endure as a strong influence in the creation of early 3D games such as Tomb Raider. In the modern day, however, it's well past its best. The game was designed for computers at a time where they were unable to offer the fast-paced action seen on consoles. Add a trial and error structure and you have a game that will likely frustrate anyone who is unwilling to adhere to its slow pace. Nevertheless, the game has built quite a legacy for itself and video games would have certainly been worse off without it. Puzzle games have the unfortunate hindrance of living under the shadow of Tetris. To the untrained eye, any drop-down or column-based game is immediately branded a Tetris clone. Look deeper, however, and you will find a fairy genre where the smallest changes make the biggest differences. Enter Super Puzzle Fighter 2, a giant of the puzzle battle where players race to create piece combinations and chains big enough to send as many blocks to the opponent as possible. Whereas Tetris sees players work to better themselves, puzzle battlers see them work to put as much pressure on the opponent as possible. Fast players encouraged to create intense back and forth battles. Puzzle Fighter does this very well with large gem stacks and chains both being viable methods for defeating opponents. Simpler than Pio Pio and more complex than Tetris, Puzzle Fighter sits well as a good bridge game between the two. <laughs> Old friend is trying to bring down a country. Son of a bitch. Our information tells us that there's 14 of them. Originally a member of the Capcom 5, Killer 7 is the work of game designer and pro wrestling fanatic Goichi Suda. The game tells an obtuse and confusing narrative based around the Killer 7, a group of assassins who exist as personalities in the mind of their leader, Harmon Smith, a wheelchair bound old timer who has the power to bring the personas to life. Killer 7 is the kind of game that can only exist when you abandon convention and experiment with what games have the potential to be. Limited movement and rooted aiming make for tense combat as the suicide bombing heaven smile rush at you with their horrifying laugh and eerie grin. Killer 7 doesn't expect you to understand its message, and it frankly doesn't care. Just strap yourself in and enjoy the ride. Strange, unpredictable and stylish, Killer 7 is a game you should experience at least once. A product of its time and a real, you had to be there moment, it is impossible to truly grasp just how mind-blowing Space Harry must have been back in 1985. Its pseudo 3D technology utilised parallax scrolling in sprites games, create a mimicry of depth that complemented the blistering speeds the game ran at. The intense speed along with the constant waves of enemies and obstacles lends itself to an experience which pushed players skills and reactions to their limits. With its bombardment of sound, speed and action, Space Hire is a game which assaults the senses and burns itself into the memories of all those who experience it. Its abundance of character leaves a lasting impression, becoming one of Sega's most iconic titles. 
While it may lose something in the transition to home gaming, there is still merit to Space Harry's design. It is a game that begs for a virtual reality remake. Released almost as an answer to Nintendo's Fire Emblem, Shining Force gave Sega Mega Drive owners a game that could stand tall and proud in an era of RPGs that was dominated by the Nintendo systems. Shining Force shares many similarities with Fire Emblem, as the player directs units across a grid to engage the enemy in combat. Over the course of these battles, the units gain experience and level up before eventually promoting to a higher class. The retainment of these basics makes Shining Force easily accessible and quickly learned despite its differences. Turn order is decided by speed, and requires players to pay attention to unit stats when planning their moves. Weapons are unbreakable, and death is not permanent. Overall, the game behaves more like a traditional RPG. Shining Force was an admirable first try by Camelot, but the sequel would be where the series really picked up. The early days of the Nintendo DS were a time of great experimentation as the introduction of dual monitors and a touchscreen opened floodgates to new kinds of games that were not possible elsewhere. Enter Trauma Center, a surgeon simulation game which sets itself up for one of the greatest bait and switch jobs of all time as the stakes constantly escalate to new heights of absurdity. What begins as a humble hospital drama quickly becomes a bioterrorism epic as players find themselves disarming bombs and fighting man-made bioweapons. Trauma Center is not a game that rewards patience. It demands speed from the players to perform surgical feats that would be impossible to pull off in real life. It's a difficult game which treads the line between pleasant and genuine frustration as players overcome what is at times incredibly oppressive design. There's really nothing else like it. Capcom's Strider is many things. It's an incredibly short game that can be beaten in less than 15 minutes. It is also an incredibly difficult game that will stretch those minutes into hours if you don't know what you're doing. It was a beautiful game for its time thanks to the detailed and fluid set of animations found on Strider Hear You and the rest of the cast. The environmental variation only further helped push Strider as a masterwork in game artistry. Animation and aesthetic were a big part of Strider's identity. More than anything else, however, Strider was one of the first games to truly master set piece design. It comes at you fast with every mower being designed to stay with the player long after completion. The game respects the player's time and delivers action to them with as little padding as possible, an incredibly influential work. you from Spaceport 9. Tonight I'm investigating reports that aliens have invaded and are forcing people to dance. Tetsuya Mizuguchi is a master of synesthesia, having worked on the likes of Res, Numenes, Child of Eden, and most recently Tetris Effect. But it wasn't always that way. Mizuguchi was once the guy who made Sega Rally. Racing games were nice, but Mizuguchi wanted to create works of art which would push the boundaries of what games had the potential to be. For Mizuguchi, that potential would be found in the music genre. Space Channel 5 is little more than a copy of Simon, but for what it lacks in gameplay originality, it more than makes up for in creativity. The game oozes with stylistic identity as its 70s disco-inspired sci-fi aesthetic carries the game with its charm and camp. Space Channel 5 is a good game, but one that has become little more than a footnote in the history of the music genre and the career of Tetsuya Mizuguchi. Finding Blade sits in a weird spot in the Fire Emblem series. 
Its protagonist found global fame as an unlockable fighter in Super Smash Bros. Melee. The rest of Enigma Round Boy would only persist when it was decided that his game would never see a release in the Western Hemisphere. As it would turn out, there was a good reason for that. His game was incredibly frustrating. Finding Blade is hindered by three major issues. Weapons are incredibly inaccurate. Many players will see their strategies ruined by unwanted attack misses at the worst possible times. Enemy reinforcements appear after the player turn ends and will often ambush without warning. And finally, Roy just straight up sucks thanks to a late game promotion that prevents him from ever being fireball. Finding Blade is a solid fire emblem, but the series would not have survived in the rest had it debuted with Roy. It's an acquired taste. Thank you.